welcome to another edition of Weekly Digest, a government information agency program that keeps you informed on what the administration has been doing that will create a better environment for citizens. I'm your host, Janelle Carter. Thank you for joining us. In this week's presentation for the period October 24th through 31st, 2014, over 200 Amerindian leaders gathered for National Tushaw's Council 2014 meeting. Two new witnesses testify as a sixth session of the Walter Rodney COI continues, and Guyana's housing sector has become the envy of many Caribbean countries. The 2014 National Tushaw's Council meeting, which is being held under the theme Harnessing the Power of Our Leadership, with participation of over 200 Amerindian leaders, opened on October 29th. The NTC Forum allows for discussion on developmental projects and policies that are beneficial to Amerindian communities, issues facing these communities, and ways of moving forward. Chairperson of the National Tushaus Council, Derek John, in his address to his fellow leaders, reminded them of the importance of humility, transparency, and accountability as they serve in their respective communities. In addition, John lauded the administration for the many developmental projects and the policies from which numerous Amerindian communities continue to benefit. We, the indigenous peoples, we have played a significant role in maintaining monitoring of resources. And in fact, today, we want to say that with the investment of these funds that go in directly to Amerindian communities. This investment is paying dividend in the transformation of our economy, in our villages, and in our everyday life. Mr. President, again, we want to say that we will continue to work together with your government as we continue to achieve, as we continue to aspire, Guyana is a role model to the world. Meanwhile, Amerindian leaders were given the opportunity to meet and interact with the various sector ministers on issues, progress, and a way forward for the further development of their communities. With new witnesses before the Rodney Commission of Inquiry, it was made clear that the PNC government was responsible for the death of Dr. Walter Rodney. It was highlighted, too, that the bomb was detonated from outside the car in which he was sitting. Crime Chief of the Guyana Police Force, Senior Superintendent Leslie James, completed his evidence before the sixth session of the COI by indicating that the 34-year case of Dr. Walter Rodney's assassination is closed since the main suspect, Gregory Smith, is dead. However, two new witnesses brought more evidence before the Commission this week. I have heard tell that there are claims that Walter Rodney was killed by his own activity, that he was having a bomb which exploded and killed him. I don't believe that to be true. Um, the issue of walkie-talkies arose, and as I think I might have mentioned in my statement, one of the aspects of the dictatorship was that our equipment was constantly being broken up or stolen. Insisting the dictatorship PNC government conducted state terrorism, Dr. Omawali ruled out violence from PPP, saying he never considered himself in danger from that party, but only from the PNC government's state machinery. Meanwhile, Nirmal Rohit Kanai took to the stand and was accepted as an expert witness with respect to electronics and explosive devices. The equipment would have been, if taken from the army, would be the Harris device. Yes. Not a toy device. Not a toy device. That's what I'm putting to you. Okay. But I've asked you whether you were in a position to compare and contrast the one that uh, was actually used on the very night and compare it and contrast it with the one used in the army. No. We um, know for sure that it was a Harris phone, a Harris device, yes. photo phone, because Dr. School said that. Yes. So that's established. But and that's a, phone, a, a, a device that could be used at the level, at the military level. Can I explain that the careful examination of Dr. Frank Scruz's report on the findings at the scene of the explosion on June 30, 1980, had prompted him to carry out an investigation into the components of the bomb and electronic device allegedly used to carry out the assassination of Dr. Rodney. 
Much of his testimony has shed light on the technical aspects of the communications device disguised as a deadly bomb that exploded in the lap of Dr. Rodney on that fateful night. Foreign investors continues to show confidence in Ghana's economy as Caribbean conglomerate Neilan Massey rebrands itself and invests U.S. $10 million into the local economy. Massey Group of Companies, formerly Neil and Massey Group of Companies, commissioned a multi-million U.S. dollar distribution center at Montrose, East Coast, Demerara. Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh said this new investment into Guyana's economy shows continued investors' confidence and welcomed the company's decision to decentralize its location outside of Georgetown. The presence of this regional, indeed this hemispheric brand, now a unified Massey brand, represents to me significant, tangible demonstration of the confidence of this large Caribbean group, this large international company in the business environment that we have worked so hard to create. And I want to thank the principals of the Massey group, Gervais, you, and your board, the group board in Trinidad and Tobago, the other members of the executive, the leadership of the group subsidiary in Guyana, the holding company in, in Guyana, and the leadership of the subsidiaries in Guyana. I wish to thank you for this very strong expression of confidence in Guyana. The company's rebranding is part of similar activities which recently took place in Jamaica and Barbados. Guyana has been receiving significant investments, both local and foreign, a testimony to a stable economy and investor confidence. Over the years, over 100,000 Guyanese families have had their dreams of home ownership realized, a dream that continues to be fulfilled for many others. From the distribution of 359 house lots in 1993, today over 100,000 have been given out to Guyanese. To realize home ownership, government has been instrumental in getting several commercial banks to lower their mortgage interest rates for citizens. This has enabled many house lot recipients to acquire a loan to build their homes. To ensure housing areas are properly developed, the government has been inputting huge sums in housing areas in terms of support infrastructure. These include roads, drainage and electricity. It's an accomplishment. It feels pretty good after, you know, a long wait. Well, I am very pleased. The wait has been long. And when I received the letter, I actually jumped with elation. All across the country, numerous housing schemes have been developed in various categories, low, middle, and high income to meet the needs of all recipients. This vibrant housing sector created by the PPPC government has ensured that Guyanese are enjoying a better standard of living. Stay tuned. More of the Weekly Digest after the break. Guyana as a tourist destination continues to receive international acclaim. The reputable National Geographic Traveler has named Destination Guyana as one of the must-see places in 2014. The renowned magazine said Guyana is the best-kept secret in South America with stunning natural wonders. This year, increased focus will be placed on enhancing the standards within the industry, focusing on tourism products and services, multi-destination itinerary planning, events management, ecotourism, and sustainable principles and guidelines, as well as a grading scheme which will be developed for the industry. In an effort to respond more promptly to citizens, the Home Affairs Ministry has launched an online crime reporting system which allows citizens who possess or have access to cell phones, computers, or other devices with internet connections to report criminal activities. Citizens can get instant access to security personnel on BlackBerry Messenger via 2804E429. Reports of corruption can also be made on www.ipaythebribe.com. 
These reports can be made anonymously. Ghana is set to achieve the goal set by the United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF of universal birth registration by 2050. The General Register Office has launched an intensive campaign. It has decentralized its services to specifically cater to the needs of residents living in the interior location. Bedside registration is also done in several public hospitals. There are now 200 registration centers operating in the 10 regions. Citizens are urged to ensure that all births are registered. Pick up a copy of the latest newspaper, The Guyanese, published by the Government Information Agency of Guyana, with you, the diaspora, in mind. The Guyanese is available at over 100 locations, including Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and the Guyana Consulate in Manhattan. Pick up your free copy of The Guyanese today. You are watching the Weekly Digest. Hundreds of millions of dollars have already been distributed of the $2 billion that will be spent on the Because We Care program. This newest initiative of the administration has been evoking numerous comments from recipients since its launch on October 11th. This $10,000 education grant has been extended to 188,406 families of students of public nursery, primary, and secondary schools. Thousands of residents of several regions have already received their grants. I'm benefiting from the voucher, and thank you very much to the government for giving me it. It's good. At least it can help the children to, to, yeah, help the children to buy shoes and so snacky and so that they could be at school. Yes, it's a good thing. That's what I tell you just now. Um, it's to help them to buy their books and other things too. When I think about giving out in, um, the government giving out in the voucher, it gonna, it's very helpful for the children. It could help them to buy things to put in the lunch kit and it could help them for the passage, bus fare passage. I have two kids and I feel that the grant is a good thing. At least it's going to help me to, you know, to buy something else for the kid to go to school with. Like, this thing. So I feel it's a good thing. They get a lot of benefit from it. They, two of my children, the, the mother died, but they are uh, still by the finance, the school, from the government, the, with the uniform and so on. It helps me a lot because I was from, I was from Wainy, really. We, we never had school before. And the children are fortunate, they get sent up from a secondary level. And, and uh, I feel that great about the medium because I never go to school because I didn't have no school in Wainy before. I born and grow in Wainy. The distribution will continue across the country until all schools are served. Guyana's focus on improving education delivery across the country is paying off. In fact, the country has been topping the Caribbean at the regional examinations since 2006. Every single country in this Caribbean has the same problems we have. Every single country has problems in getting large percentages in classes in mathematics. Every country does not as well as we would like to do in English. Every country has problems attracting students to the science fields. Every single country has some of the literacy problems we have. Every country, however, is not bringing home the results Gaia is bringing home. And so that makes us stand tall in this region and indeed in the entire world because even as we have the same problems, our students are excited. We have to be doing something right. And so I say to the teachers, to the school, to the government, to the president who leads the cabinet that has a strong focus on education and how to make our people better, let's give them a hand. While schools that are considered top schools continue to excel, other learning institutions from even the most remotest of communities are now producing academic high flyers. This speaks to the equitable distribution of resources by the government. Now when we announce national grade 6 exams, we're announcing um, students in the top 2% from Crocker and Region 6 and Skeldon and Anna Regina and Sully and Lenora and Cornelia Ida and Linda and, you know, we're announcing our pine by Region 9, students from all over this, this Country. Over 30 students from four learning institutions received awards in 12 different categories at the Education Ministry's 18th National Award Ceremony. 
Among the awardees are the four students who not only topped the country but the entire region at the 2014 CSEC examinations. They are Elisa Hamilton, Rian Chan, Aliyah Kadir, and Kishan Critchlow. Persons working in the electricity sector have received training to raise awareness on the standards and role of the sector to eradicate illegal connections and provide a better service to Guyanese. Contractors are urged to become certified in their trade so as to improve their chances of employment, while Public Works Minister Robson Ben instructed them to practice integrity in all aspects of the sector. Minister Ben told contractors that the safety of persons are jeopardized when installation standards are not met. I am happy to be here to make a few remarks with respect to this seminar on promoting awareness of sector standards and the role of the sector agencies. I think at this time it is apt that we, again, we have an opportune time to review where we are with respect to the question of improving, maintaining, codifying electrical standards because we've had, since the drafting and the accepting of the laws in Parliament in 2008 that we would have had by now, Honorable Prime Minister, ample time for everyone, both in the industry and the people who practice, on the side of the regulators, to be well aware of what is required, what we ought to do to promote better and safer standards with respect to electrical installation and to the general electrical practice. The minister said there are a number of questions that arise from consumers with regards to the operations of the Guyana Power and Light and its actions towards illegal connections. There's a lot of um, discussion on the ground at the interface between the public and the GPL with respect to inspections and the cutting of lights and whether indeed people are indeed stealing electricity or not, and I know a lot of people at all levels are in that illegal practice. But the question of how we do it, or whether indeed in many cases we have real GPL inspectors, or whether indeed those GPL inspectors are the people who are going out there to clip the wires, whether they are acting in the interest of GPL, or the person in the ground, or any other person, is a question that is always up in the air. The minister highlighted the monthly increase in a number of persons applying for certification of buildings as a sure sign of the economic growth in Guyana with the construction of new buildings for housing, businesses, and other purposes. Stay tuned, more of the Weekly Digest after the break. Pick up a copy of the latest newspaper, The Guyanese, published by the Government Information Agency of Guyana, with you, the diaspora, in mind. The Guyanese is available at over 100 locations, including Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and the Guyana Consulate in Manhattan. Pick up your free copy of The Guyanese today. In an effort to better their lives, more than 42,000 pensioners are currently enjoying a 25% increase in their pension. This is in addition to the waiver of the Guyana Water Incorporated bill. And in another attempt to enhance their lives, over 8,500 pensioners are benefiting from $20,000 subsidy yearly towards their electricity bills with the Guyana Power and Light Incorporated. Pensioners will enjoy a 50% increase in assistance, bringing it to $30,000 per annum for pensioners who are customers of the Guyana Power and Light Company Incorporated. Further, old age pension is to be increased by 5% with effect from May 1, 2014 to $13,125 monthly, targeting the 42,500 senior citizens. During Cabinet's statutory meeting at Office of the President on October 28, several issues of national concern were discussed. The media was subsequently briefed on Cabinet's deliberations. 
Cabinet at its October 28th statutory meeting gave its no objections to seven contracts in the areas of security, solid waste management, utilities, sport and infrastructure. The announcement by the Speaker of his intention to convene a sitting of the National Assembly on November 6 is inconsistent with parliamentary fundamentals. Cabinet, in its discussion, noted the inconsistencies of the Speaker's positions on the matter of convening Parliament. The Speaker is on record to have adopted different positions when asked to pronounce on this self same topic of convening parliament. The speaker is on record recognizing the government's unique power to convene and cabinet was advised about disclosures arising from investigations, perusal of parliamentary practices elsewhere in applicable jurisdictions that on the whole conformed the government's power to convene parliament. The issue of setting a date for the next sitting of parliament continues to engage the attention of the cabinet, and the HPS is sure that a date will be announced shortly. Meanwhile, the Kitty Health Center, which is currently operating from a rented premises, will be relocated to the Kitty Post Office, Pike and Alexander Street's location. Those who know would recall the decade-long provision of health services for outpatients and ambulatory care at the top flat of the Kitty Market. Kitty residents have since then had their ambulatory and outpatient needs addressed at a variety of locations, the most recent rental premises, a view that the Ministry of Health insists is unsustainable. The project that is proposed, supported by both the Post Office Cooperation and the Ministry of Health, and yesterday gained Cabinet's approval, was to have both facilities, both services provided under one roof. The sum of $60 million is earmarked for this project. This will be met by the Ghana Post Office Corporation and rental provided by the Health Ministry will serve to offset the costs. And now for Perspectives with Dr. Prem Mazir. It is a great irony of our times that such huge attempts are being made to deport Marxism to history's dustbin, while capitalism remains the most favored economic model for Western nations. In spite of its inhumane and degrading consequences for people, indeed, deportation of Marxism to history's dustbin would only happen where Marxism is public enemy number one, as in the United States of America. There is perhaps an amusing anecdote on this acrimony toward Marxist thinking in the United States. A newly appointed person from Britain, David Harvey, at Johns Hopkins University was a member of the university's commission in the 1970s, analyzing problems in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. In that report, Harvey indicated that he used ideas from Marx's Das Kapital. Baltimore policymakers claimed that the report was perceptive, not knowing that Harvey used Marxist ideas in the report. The point here is that the city policymakers that is in Baltimore, would have thrown that report into the dustbin 
had they known up front that the report was drawn from Marxist thinking. Harvey added that Marxist ideas worked for him and others and that the ideas were interesting. He spoke of Marxism in glowing terms in a country which is the bedrock of capitalism and where too capitalism is the most favored economic model with top capitalists as its soldiers. Under such circumstances, it is more than likely that most favored implies that top capitalists of the Western world would opt to bail out capitalism whenever it is in crisis. Capitalism has its good days and bad days. Whenever bad days emerge, capitalism adapts itself to fight off the woes from such days through the good auspices of its capitalist masters. In fact, one of several forms of adaptation that capitalism makes in overcoming its flaws in a crisis situation is increasing inequality. One substantial avenue available to raise inequality is use of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism works toward reducing the power of the government to provide social services, increasing the power of private enterprise, and put an end to controlling the free market. The march of neoliberalism is certainly anti-Marxist. On the local scene in Guyana, there is a concerted effort on the opposition's part to reduce the government's involvement and control of major public projects. For instance, over the past few years, the opposition engineered budget cuts on several capital investments, that is, public capital investments such as Chedi Jagan Airport Modernization Project, the Ogle Aerodrome Assistance, Civil Aviation Equipment and Hinterland Coastal Airstrip, San, and effectively terminated the Myla Hydro Power Project. The government's capital projects, when effectively operational, would reduce unemployment in Guyana. The slowing down of these projects, therefore, is inimical to development. The opposition's hold on these projects demonstrates its intent to increase unemployment and further increase inequality in Guyana. What this means is a developing trend toward greater inequality and an increase in the gap between the rich and the poor. Against this background, Marxist thinking is a requirement for change, a requirement to reduce inequality and a requirement to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. With those features, we have come to the end of this edition of Weekly Digest, but before we go, here's a recap of the highlights. Over 200 Amaranian leaders gather for National Tushau's Council 2014 meeting. Two new witnesses testify as sixth session of Walter Rodney COI continues, and Guyana's housing sector has become an envy of many Caribbean countries. Please note that Weekly Digest and other government information can be found on our website, www.gina.gov.gy, or you can send us your comments and suggestions at ginagovgy at gmail.com. Join us again next week as we highlight more of the government's programs and policies that are aimed at enhancing the lives of citizens. I'm your host, General Carter. Do have a safe week ahead. Goodbye.